to the comic shop I'll let you read about Cyclops I'll have you spending all you got Jawbreakers is looking hot Zach Yo, 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 Big Legit here one more time to tell you about some totally awesome comic books from the 20th century. Here we go one more time. Check it out. We're going right back to Image Comics, and we're going to compare. We are going to compare these two sexy comics right here. Cyber Force number one. Codename Strike Force number one. Yeah, let's see. we got some similarities here. Let me tell you a little bit about these. This is the creation of Mark. Silvestri, Top Cow, everybody knows Top Cow now. This is where it all started, was with Cyberforce. This came out in October of 1992. This came out in January of 1994. I never read Cyberforce growing up. And so this is very exciting for me to be able to, to have just read both of these right before I started this video. And I'm gonna start with this one. So this is codenamed Cyberforce. It's actually, it's penciled by Brandon Peterson, who I actually really like Brandon Peterson's work a lot. Plotted and scripted by Mark Silvestri. And this story was okay. You know, our boy Stryker here is guarding uh, Vladdy, who's this, you know, this, this, uh, he's not Russian, he's, uh, he's not Russian, he's Ukraine. And he's guarding him and guarding him and then, of course, you know, all hell breaks loose, right? You know, this is basic comic book story, but look at this. This is such a great, great page right here. I love this page. I love thinking outside the box. He's thinking outside the box, and I appreciate that always. And we have this character who, well, you know, looks like, you know, like a fallen angel or something, and we never quite really figure out who this guy is. I kind of like his suit, but it's also, I don't know, you know, back then it was cool, but now it just kind of looks tired or cliche maybe. Uh, too much might be a way to describe it. Despite being remarkably well drawn by Brandon Peterson. I love this shot here too. This is a great, just a great image. I mean, look at the, look at what this colorist has done. Who colored this book? Joe Chiodo. Who also drew some very great stuff too, actually. Um, you don't see a lot of Joe Chiodo's drawings, but people probably don't, I don't know if people know who that is anymore. But yeah, look at, look at his skills as a colorist just back then. Totally got the, the water reflecting off of there, you know, it reminds me of Blade Runner a little bit in that, in that sense. And you know, there we get him in all his glory and eh, just, it's not doing much for me. But the art is, you know. And I don't have a lot to say about this one. You know, this guy has three women all chained with dog collars and he's going to seek relaxation. Do not disturb me for the next 47 minutes. I'm just like, are they there willingly? Are they not there willingly? I'm kind of just confused. And this is the end, you know, and it, it, I don't know, it just didn't set up the characters well enough for me. Um, basically, all these characters just kind of refer to each other in, in passing. This is Anvil, who I always thought looked super cool. Let's open it up there. This is Bloodbow, Killraiser, Anvil, Tempest, and Striker. And I'm not sure like the time and place for this because I didn't follow Cyberforce. And so Strikeforce remains a mystery despite this being the first issue. Volume one, number one, yeah. I don't, it just didn't quite, I mean, I know who Striker is because of Cyberforce, but all the other guys, they didn't really explain who they are or what they're doing together. So this did not move the needle for me. The artwork definitely did. I mean, you can, you know, you saw it, you saw it. Look at that. How can that not move you? But the story was just a little light for me. So I'm gonna push it over that way. And we're gonna focus on this gem of a comic book. And, you know, I can't believe, let's see, this came out in 1992. So here I am 26 years later, reading this comic book for the first time, 
The Ten Men of War Part 1, art by Mark Silvestri, writer Eric Silvestri. And I think it's cool that he gives thank yous to, you know, all of his homeboys here. Very, very cool. How to get a copy of image number zero, you know, we covered that in a previous installment. You just send that bad boy in, and boom, the first shot we have is velocity, and it's a very nice shot. And we see her running, and this is a great way to open up a comic book, in my opinion. Tears streaming down her face, and very well drawn. I love the way that Mark Silvestri draws women. Um, I feel like a lot of artists kind of fall into a habit of drawing women all the same, and Mark Silvestri does not do that. All women... You know, women look different in his comics, and I appreciate it. And I always thought she looked so sexy. And not in, a, not in an intentional way where she was trying to be sexy, in a very natural way. You know, and maybe it's because she's like a little bird with the tears streaming down her face that I want to just cradle her in my arms and nurse her back to health like Andre the Giant did for Inigo Montoya before they went to find the man in black and kill the six-fingered man. So anyway, she's being hunted down in this whole like Blade Runner style sort of thing, which is kind of like what this vibe is with the Ziggy Stardust Blade Runner sort of vibe going on here. She's being hunted by these guys. And look, there's a little appearance by, by Lord Imp right here. There he is, Jacob Marlowe from Wildcats. And so she's getting hunted down. And then we have a, a Ripclaw, who was very popular, what, what you might call the Wolverine of Image Comics was the Native American Ripclaw with the spirit of the bear. And they have a poem in here, and I, I wonder, I've wondered where the poem ends. She runs like the deer, swift and strong, but afraid and alone, hiding from the man machines that serve the god of death. From the poem Freedom Run by Robert Bearclaw. I don't know if it keeps going. They will hunt her down and break her, build a cage and take her life away. For they are blind to the spirits, those who have summoned me, and soon they must face that which they can never break. The spirit with no fear of man or his machines. The spirit of the bear. The spirit that will guide the hands of Ripclaw. And just go ahead. Let me back away. Take a look. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Look at that. Isn't that wonderful? Doesn't that make you want to read a comic book? It makes me want to read a comic book. I was excited when I got to that page. And that's why this comic, back in 1992, was a comic that could move the needle and could get fans to turn out and to pick up issues of it. People would buy multiple issues of Image Comics and save them because they were worth more money later in the speculative market because the art was sexy and the stories were oftentimes good but especially the art was sexy. And look at that. Look at how his claws are reflected by the, the lightning bolts. And I just am really blown away by this imagery. That's gorgeous, that's gorgeous. And you can see why people would compare him to Wolverine, of course, but he's not Wolverine, he's Ripclaw, and he's actually a pretty good character. And this story is great. This is Timmy, so Timmy's like, in this uh, advanced aerospace and uh, aeronautics design, I can't read that, let me. Cybertech's advanced aerospace and avionics division. Okay, so here's Timmy and he's working on, you know, some stuff because he's a little whiz, whiz kid. And, you know, his buddy here is helping him out too. And uh, let's see, you know, they're talking to Ripclaw, and then this is, you know, it just gets better because now we have a mutant here, Mr. Bluestone, who is running for mayor in Manhattan. And he, or excuse me, he's at this, this you know, rally in Manhattan speaking, and there's an assassin and, and striker, you know, striker, he's, he's been, been hired you know, to watch him, to bodyguard him. And he, you know, of course, comes out and destroys him because he's got one arm, two arm, three arm, four arms. You know, three arms on that side and one on that side. I never understood how he could stand up. And that's why I didn't like it when I was a kid. But if I would have cracked this open, see, it's funny because this, this cover is not, it's not enough. It's not doing enough for me. This is doing something for me and this is doing something for me. 
but all this up here is not doing anything for me. But this is really doing something for me. It's very interesting. You know, he takes out the assassin, the would-be assassin. He takes out additional assassins who don't know what to do. So they run away like little chickens. And then Cyblade's out here. She shows up, and I don't know, she's kind of like, uh, she's kind of like Psylocke. And if you're thinking of using that gun, think again. I'm not paid to think. Well then. You should get a big bonus for this. And she just, you know, blows his chest out, basically, like she's the predator. And this is Jesse Ventura. And <laughs> Don't spend it all in one place. Ha! Zinger. And then, you know, this is kind of cool. This is Impact. And he's running towards the guys escaping, right? They're escaping over here. And then we come over here. And Impact is chasing him down. Impact chasing And he just runs right through the car. And this is such a dynamic image here, too that this would make me want to buy this comic book too as a kid. If they would have put that on the front cover, I probably would have picked this up back then. And Impact, I think, is kind of a kid, because he, uh, I'd forget about the gun, dude. Somebody might get hurt. I don't know, that's how I would do the voice maybe for Impact. And so that, that appeals to me too, that like there could be a kid who's big and strong, you know, kind of like a Kind of like a Captain Marvel, not you know, Shazam. That's what I'm talking about. Meanwhile, in another part of the city, Little Velocity is still trying to hightail it out of here. She gets caught by the bad guys, by the cops. These are the cops, C-O-P-S. It stands for something, I can't remember. Um, Ribclaw, you know, shows up out of nowhere from the Green Mist. You know, this is the Angel of Death in the Ten Commandments right here. And he is, you know, the Angel of Death, obviously. So Ribclaw attacks him. Gotham City is not big enough for both of them. Batman, Revenge of the Joker, only from Sunsoft. It's payback time on 16-bit systems. So, Ribclaw takes the dude out completely. This is all really well written, too. I just want to stress that the story, actually, you see a lot of action here. I haven't really covered much of the story because I want you to go out and buy this because I got this gorgeous comic for 50 cents. And it was worth it. I would have paid... I would have paid $5 for a story this good. If, if any comic book companies are watching this, I would pay $5 for this comic book right here, for anything that, that had a story as good as the story is in this. It has a lot of depth from mutants running for mayor and attempting to be assassinated to sexy redhead mutant David Bowie chicks like having to escape crazy cyborg ballista girl. Her name is Ballistic. Um... So anyways, I would, I would do that. So remember that, comic book companies, that this is something that would move the needle, a good story that has action and suspense, character growth, uh, uh, character growth. That's, that's a great thing. Um, I love to learn more about characters. My favorite part of The Lord of the Rings is the Fellowship of the Ring, and it's actually the first disc. Once they, once they get to the Inn at the Prancing Pony, that's, I'm done at that point. They've made it as far as I wanted to go because I didn't want to leave the Shire because I was so fascinated by the characters. And it was all right when we got to Rivendell, but they didn't tell me enough about the elves. I wanted to spend half an hour with them too. And so that kind of disappointed me. But anyways, this comic is gorgeous, gorgeous. The printing is vastly superior to Marvel Comics at this time. And the art is absolutely mesmerizing and the story is second to none. And then they add another plot twist. Look at this great plot twist and look at how we go from, you know, this being this white page to this being this deep purplish page that, you know, similar, similar to the gloved hands of legit. So, and this chick is not Mystique. You know, I know you think she is. She's not. She's awesome too. Really, really sexy, really gorgeous. I always wanted to date a blue chick, but I never did. Uh, but anyway, so find out about this story. Things are, things are getting more suspense. And then we flash back to when Velocity was a little kid and her stepfather is a crazy hillbilly hick about to beat the crap out of her and his stained wife beat her. It's terrible. It's gonna, like, and mom is just, you know, totally feckless mother, worthless piece of trash who's just gonna let dad beat the, let the stepfather beat the living crap out of, you know, a four-year-old little girl. And so, you know, this is good, though, because the truth is, is that there are some kids who, who are reading this comic book 
who have that for a stepfather. And so this helps those kids realize they're not alone in the world. I didn't ever have to endure this, and I'm very grateful for it. And I'm sorry for all you guys out there if you had to deal with this kind of crap. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. And if you are a kid who's having to deal with this kind of crap, what you need to do is you need to talk to someone who will help you. The principal of your school will help you. That I know. Uh, a police officer will be able to help you. And they, won't, they won't turn on you. They will, they will help you. And I just want to say that real quick. Uh, and I want you guys to go out and buy this comic and give it to a kid. Because you don't necessarily know what that kid's going through if you're not that kid's parents. And this might help him understand that he's not alone and understand that he can grow up to be something better than what this man is. This child can grow up to be better than this one. And that is what it's all about. And then we find out Timmy here is a little robot boy, which I absolutely love. You know, nothing beats a robot kid, right? Who wouldn't want one? And he's got all these robot friends. He's got this robotic Scooby-Doo even. You know, we aren't going to call it Scooby-Doo, but we, we know what's going on there, right? And all of a sudden, you know, somebody pumpkin bombs the hell out of the place. And she's the, the, like the lone survivor. And it's ballistic. And she's back. And she's got this crazy Skeletor-looking dude who's like Skeletor as a cybernetic pirate, which I think is pretty cool. And here's like the evil bones of Dr. Manhattan. And here is a pretty generic-looking bad guy. And here's a guy I barely even noticed back here who also looks like a pretty generic executioner guy. And this is... A saw and a saw and a saw, and I'm not sure if that's part of this person's hand or what. But this guy and this guy, I think, actually look really cool, and they, they make me want to read it more. I wish that he was not there. I wish they weren't matching colors. I wish they wouldn't have worn matching colors on this day. Uh, but obviously they're a couple because, you know, they... they got the yellow blonde kind of vibe going and the purple vibe. So they're a couple and they have the cybernetic thing going on. And I'm not sure how much of them is cybernetic. I'm curious to know that, but I don't know if I'm going to find that out. But I'll tell you one thing. This has absolutely hashtag move the needle for me. And I am actually going to go back to the comic book shop and I'm going to buy cyber force number two. I'm going to buy cyber force number three. I'm going to buy Cyber Force number four because this was a hot comic. This was a hot comic. And I wish I would have read this when I was a kid. Oh, let's open it all the way up. Look at that. Isn't that fun? This has got like a very kind of manga thing going on here. Very different. I wish that this was as well drawn as this and the stuff on the inside. I don't understand how this ended up being the cover. It just is... Looks like it was rushed. Not a lot of time taken, but here's the thing. If you gotta pick up one of these today for 50 cents, I'm telling you right now, this is the guy you want. It's not gonna let you down. It's gonna give you a great story. It's gonna give you some unique characters uh, that you're not gonna see in other places, even though you might think that that's Wolverine. It's not Wolverine. Ripclaw's actually a pretty cool character, and we're gonna get into Ripclaw a little bit more in other videos. But go get this, because this is the kind of comic book that will hashtag move the needle. Because it has action, it has excellent art, and it has a fantastic story that is multi-layered. And has very much, very much a, a lot of depth to it. And I'm looking forward to seeing where this miniseries goes from 1992 here, 26 years later. So, check this out. If you read Cyber Force, please comment below and tell me how far into the run I should go. Should I pick up the first four issues of the miniseries and then ignore it for the rest of my life? Should I pick up the first 25 issues of Cyber Force? When does it stop getting good? What is the best issues of Cyber Force you read? Please tell me in the comments below. Please give a like. Please subscribe. Push the ding dong for notifications. And I'll talk to you guys later. Peace.